Good evening. Um, thank you very much for having me here. I'm uh, Georgia. I come from the Netherlands, as you can see, a country full of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't bring you any joints. I, I brought you the coal, so I'm coughing a lot, so I'm sorry for that, that maybe I have to stop uh, sometime. But I'm going to talk with you about comprehensive sex education, especially what's happening on the global, in the global world. Uh, but I want to start with a personal experience. In the beginning of the 1980s, far before you were born, I gave my first sex education lesson. And it was in a, sec in a secondary technical school for Catholic, only boys. So I started to talk about friendship, relationships, sex, contraception. And there were 20 boys looking at me like that. And I got more nervous and more nervous. And at a certain moment, one of the boys said, Miss, can I ask you a question? And I was so happy. I said, yes, please. And he said, how many times are you doing it each week? And I was really thinking, oh my god. So I started to, to, to stem. I said, well, it's, you know, quality is better than quantity. You know, all this kind of nonsense. <laughs> So that's, after that lesson, I was no longer a sex educator virgin. I lost it. But luckily, I didn't stop. And it started for me a journey for all over the world, working with and for young people to talk about sexuality, sexual health, sexual rights, and sex education. And before I'm going to talk about CSE, I want to talk about the most important players here, which are young people. Because I think globally, sex and sexuality and young people are still two concepts that really don't marry very well. We're still very stuck in a very negative narrative that young people are not sexual beings, or if they are, they're risk takers, they don't know what they're doing, and what we should teach them is to say no. To say no or to postpone, to wait, 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 and to abstain. It's really time we start having a different narrative, where we start thinking we should help young people to empowerment and giving them the evolving capacities to ask for a yes when they want to and learn to accept a no when the other one doesn't want to have sex. That is real uh, empowerment. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about CSE. Now, oh no, I want to say one thing for you. Of course, there are risks. We all take risk. Risk is part of our life. But the mo if I see young people on skateboards doing the most scary things, we don't talk about it. They're one-time sex and there are risk takers. We should stop denying young people giving information because in that way they don't even know how to deal with risk. But all of here we have taken risk and we have to learn to deal with it. So we sh should stop talking so much about risks. But that's about young people, I have to talk with you about comprehensive sex education and sex education. For me, there's a difference between sex education and comprehensive sex education. I'm going to talk mainly about happening in schools. I know Hera does an amazing job as peer educators, but I'm concentrating on schools uh, now because it tells a lot how a country looks at sex education, how they treat it in the school setting. For me, sex education, you can compare it with teaching about a car. You open the bonnet and you look what's inside, where your ovaries are hanging, where your uterus is. You slice the penis in two and then it's very scary, you see what's inside. You may know a little bit, if you start driving, how to put on a safety belt, if you're lucky. So they tell you about condoms. Now for me, comprehensive sex education may be that, but it's much more, it's about where am I going on this journey? With whom am I going on this journey? Someone of the same sex or of the opposite sex? What will be my roadmap? Where will I want to end when it comes to sex? For me, that's something different. Actually, sex education says, if you want to do it, well, do it safe. But comprehensive sex education says, what is it? <coughs> what is sexuality education? What does it mean? I have to take one sip, sorry. <coughs> 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 
So for me, that's a big difference. But of course, there's also <coughs> an international definition. I'm not going to read it. This is the latest definition by UNESCO. <coughs> I was part of that. I wrote the new UNESCO guidelines. If you only knew how long this took, how much fights there were. But <coughs> I think that this one tries to combine the more biological aspects, the human rights aspects, and also the emotional aspects, and a little bit about positive. But we're not <coughs> there yet, but it may help us. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Now, if you compare the UNESCO guidelines in 2009 with UNESCO guidelines now, there's a huge difference. There's a difference in the content. Then it was all about HIV. It was all about risks. And now it's looking very comprehensively at sexuality and, <coughs> and the sexual development of young people. There's a lot on sexual diversity. There's a tiny little bit about abortion. We couldn't really get it in. <coughs> there's a lot about gender. And there's a lot about happiness and about well-being. But you know what we couldn't get in? <coughs> it's about families. We couldn't get in that you can have same-sex parents. UNICEF couldn't live with it. So, <coughs> <coughs> so they forbade it. But it's very different than 2009. The big issue in 2009 was masturbation. UNFPA, UNICEF said no to masturbation. No way it should be in and taught to young people. Then WHO came in. IPPF came in, and all these high-level bosses were talking on the phone all day about masturbation. I have very many fantasies about that, but I won't tell you about that. <laughs> so there's a big difference. And the baby is a step in the right direction. Now, if you look at progress made in the world and in Europe, <coughs> two researches and reviews, one by UNESCO, and one by WHO, BZTA, and IPPF. And what they see, that there's an enormous more appetite for CSE in countries and in governments. It's also because of the SDGs. But what they also see, that still, in many countries, sexuality education is not compulsory. It's a kind of extracurricular kind of job to do. And often in many topics, like sexual diversity, like gender, like sexual health, and especially sexual pleasure, are not included. What do we know about it for further? We know now, much more than before, that without parents, we cannot achieve anything. So I'm so happy that someone will talk about that. Without the involvement of young people, sex education will not succeed. We also know that you cannot give comprehensive sex education without providing service. They need to be linked. If you don't do it, it doesn't work. And there are two very good examples of that. One is Estonia. You know, when the Soviet Union stopped, you know, and, and Estonia became independent, they had a very young government, and they looked at Sweden, and they asked Sweden for help. They had a very high abortion rate and a very high HIV rate. So what they did, they introduced compulsory sex education in school, they had youth-friendly clinics, and they changed the laws to make access to service easier for young people without parental consent. Within three years, the abortion rate was more than half, and the, uh, the HIV rate as well. And it was extremely cost-effective. The opposite happened in Finland. In Finland, very good country, fantastic sex education, youth-friendly services. But at a certain moment, the government said, well, it's enough, it's enough. We don't spend more, any more money. Within three years, the abortion rate was doubled again among young people. So you see what it can do. I, I'm not saying that everything is linear, but it absolutely um, contributes to it. But what is actually more important now, and that really started like five years ago, by pop counts is that we have to look at gender. 
because gender and gender equity really contributes to less uh, sexual violence and sexual harassment and better uh, uh, sexual lives and better um, uh, safer sex. And I want to say something here to the man here. Because there's now two researches done in Germany and the US of men who help in the household, who do the dishes sometimes, who help with the children. You know you have three times more sex than men who don't do it. <laughs> so clean those toilets and you get a lot of compensation for that. So, but the interesting thing is that we always look at health outcomes. I think research has to look much more at other issues like empowerment, happiness, and well-being. And you see that organizations like WHO is trying to find other indicators that will help to improve comprehensive sex education. A thing we're not looking at so much, we're so obsessed with the content, we don't look at the delivery and the implementation. I am in awe of teachers because they really want to motivate young people. But the problem is, is that a lot of teachers are still very focused on cognitive skills. Now, cognitive skills are important, but for sex education and comprehensive sex education, you also need other skills. You need critical thinking skills. You need to understand the norms and values of your society. You need to be critical about it. You need to be able to communicate. And UNESCO has really introduced the idea of a more learner-centered approach, where young people and teachers become much more equal, become starting debate about things, where not the teacher tells you this is how it is, but you go together on the journey to explore how sexuality, what it means in your society. And that's really interesting. So we have to think very much at teacher training and in-service training for, for teachers. Now, I want to talk about three, I think, important new, new areas. One is, of course, the social media. Is it a curse or is it a blessing? When it comes to young people and sexuality and social media, people, oh, it's terrible. Sexting, bullying, pornography, all these kind of things. And that's true. And we have to help young people to be safe online but it also can give them enormous joy and pleasure as well. You know, I had to play doctor to ex with my neighbor boy to understand what his body was look like. You have one thing of your fingers and you can see whatever you want to see. So there's an enormous potential for social media. And I will tell you one thing, maybe that helps you in your advocacy. In the Netherlands, within four years, the age of sexual debut, so the first sexual intercourse, which was 17 years old, became 18 and a half last year. I don't think it's a good thing, but okay, that's what happened. And you know why? Because of social media. Because everybody has sex on the phone. And don't dare to do it anymore in real. And I think that is very sad, because the real thing, I think, is much better. But I'm old, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Another thing we have to think about is contextualization. Everybody, you know, you have that here as well. In our culture, you cannot talk about it. It's not our culture. These are not our norms. These are not our values. True, of course, sex education and CSC need to be adapted to the context. But it should never lead that the C is left out. It's totally heteronormative. And whose culture are we talking about? The culture of your political leaders? the culture of your religious leaders, or the culture of you as young people. I think we should really look what is the culture of young people when we develop our sex education guidelines. Oh. And now the most important thing is pleasure. Is it a luxury or is it a crucial part? For me, it's an absolute crucial part. Sex is important. Sex, of course, the sexual violence, the sexual abuse. But sex should be fun, sex should be pleasurable, sex will give you confidence, will give you happiness. But it also is now we have research that women who enjoy sex are much better contraceptive uptakers of women who don't enjoy sex. So it's, there is an absolute link between safer sex 
and the enjoyment of sex. And that's logical. If you can tell to your partner, I want you to move a little bit like this, or I want you to touch me a little bit more like that, it's much easier to say, and you better put a condom on as well. So if you can communicate about sexuality, that sexual is something pleasurable, that it gives you um, happiness, I think it's absolutely not a luxury. There are millions and millions of sexual acts per year. Why can't we talk about it? There's not an act which is done more than, than sexual acts. If you think about how many acts there are. But anyway, it should be pleasurable. And I want to think about Sweden. Sweden really has done a lot to promote sexual pleasure. And you think maybe it goes far, but if you look into those books, they're really good, they really explain how to enjoy sexuality, how to do it, how to actually enjoy it. If you have time, look at their latest video on safer sex and pleasure. It's brilliant and it's really something we can learn from. So where are we going? I think after listening to Neil, I got a little bit pessimistic. I hope still that I can be positive about it. I do. We have ideas, and that makes us different from animals. We can eroticize. Animals can't, and let's be proud of that. And what she says as well is that love is a verb. You have to work on it. It's different in every stage of your life. It's not something romantic that falls from the skies. You have to learn to love and to be with each other. So what I want you to be is to be like this tree. Think outside your box and be brave. Thank you very much. <laughs>